The Framingham study started, I think, in the late 1940s and continued on onwards. There's still there's a second, third generation Framingham participants in this. Um, it was, at the time, uh, quite a remarkable, interesting study. Uh, they were, uh, of course, uh, following people uh, with respect to, as I recall, five different biomarkers. You know, what was their blood pressure like? What was their serum cholesterol like? What was their, I think, body weight? Uh, a couple of other things. And in those days, 40s, 50s, and 60s in that territory, uh, the whole question concerning the relationship of heart disease with diet was emerging, not just from NASA, but from others. And so it was organized by an NIH team headed by Dr. Bill Castelli, a man I know, knew, I should say. Um, and uh, they just collected the data really quite carefully. And what they found, as they followed over the years, the higher the cholesterol in the blood, the higher the rates of heart disease. That was one of their big findings. Uh, and of course, you have heard me say before, that doesn't mean cholesterol causes it, but it's a really good indicator. Still is. And uh, blood pressure, blood pressure and heart disease. So they have like five factors. And so they got to a point where they said, okay, if you have three of these factors, or two high or two or one or whatever, you're at this level of risk of heart disease. And so it was kind of a pioneer. It was a pioneer, forerunner kind of study, done well with the tools they had at the time. And Dr. Castelli was a, he was a professionalist for that sort of thing. So I think that, I think that Framingham study really contributed a lot. There was, we've learned a lot more since, but it was a great start. Well, they start eat like us and they die, they die like us. It's that simple. In China, for example, I followed some of their statistics as it changed. As soon as they started changing their diet, I mean, it was, it's just almost like instantaneously. Heart disease and, and cancer started growing up. And it didn't just like us. And in diabetes, in fact, in China, it's really quite interesting. In China, and there's other examples of this, those who are accustomed to a more plant-based type of diet, and got their bodies are accustomed to it, they seem to be more sensitive to the ravages of the Western diet when they start it. And so they'll get diabetes maybe more frequently and at a higher level. And so you, you, and the Chinese are knowing this themselves. They, there was an awful lot of Chinese who come to this country and adopt the Western diet. One of the first things that come up is diabetes. They seem to be more sensitive than you know, us folks who have been around becoming accustomed to some of that a little bit as our body handles it a little bit better. Dr. Esselton is obviously the expert on that, not me. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but it does relieve pain and does, you know, look pretty good for a while and, and so forth and so on. But uh, it's not dealing with the cause. It's, it's, it's basically putting a Band-Aid, maybe in this, in this case a big Band-Aid, it's putting a Band-Aid over a wound. And see, you know, and, and let's see, he got the wound from being hit on the head a few times, you're going to put a Band-Aid on it. You've got to stop the cause. You've got to stop the cause. So bypass surgery is not the way to go. Sometimes it's maybe it's central for another few months of life or years or something like this, but... It is possible, period. Dr. Esselstyn has shown that was really very impressive data. Dr. Ornish uh, has done something very similar. Esselstyn's went a little longer, but Dr. Ornish, is, he's the one to first report that in the early 90s. But before them, in fact, there was a fellow by the name of Morrison who got some evidence like that too. So now it's, it's, it's inarguable. You change your diet. Heart disease is gone. Gone. If you go back and go back to the old diet again, it'll come back and get you. So you gotta make the change stay there. Said that's a religion um, born in the United States for the most part, by the way, back in the 1800s. <clears throat> the person, the woman who sort of started that, um, apparently, a, a brilliant woman, 
not terribly well educated, but she wrote some really interesting stuff. Uh, and, uh, and, and it was focused on the idea, get your food right, and you get better health, and therefore you're, you're entering into heaven, heaven might hit a little bit better too as well. And she did that, religion founded on it, on that and some other considerations, no smoking and so forth. And so the Adventists have, I don't know what the total number is now, but it's right around the world. And the United States, they have a medical school, Loma Linda, California. I've spoken there a couple of times. I've gotten to know the Adventists um, oftentimes very well. I've spoken to a number of different Adventist groups. And the, the data show that I think 40 to 50 percent of Adventists are close to being vegetarian because they followed what she did, what she said. Um, but there's a lot that don't. So they did a study on those who did, compared to those who didn't. And those are some of the better studies that have been published in recent years. And, and what it really showed was the same thing I'm talking about. Those who have a more plant-based diet, um, for example, women live, I think the latest figures are 12 years on average longer. Men, year, men live about eight or nine years longer. So they've been able to follow them now over some two or three generations. And just another piece of the puzzle. It says the same thing that the Framingham study has showed, and now Ornish and Esselton and others as well saying the same thing. I don't know how many more times we need to do that. This is, to me, it's not news. This is not news. It's, it's there. The problem is the government tries to suppress this. Yeah, the invitation for me to come and speak to the Real Truth About Health conference that you folks have been putting on uh, is because you're embracing, it seems to me, what I'm talking about. You're going to get some people and you're uh, obviously going to make this available to a large audience elsewhere. Uh, I'm all for that kind of approach because, um, as I said, I spent about 20 years, I should t say, it, something we didn't discuss, about 20 years in national policy development. I was on the so-called expert committees, you know, from the late 70s onwards. And so, and these committees are the ones who advise the government of what dietary advice to give, if you will. And so I worked closely with a political arena at the very highest levels, both here and abroad and other places. And so I have seen, you know, how information is controlled. I know who's doing it, and I have a good feeling for why. And uh, actually in 1985-86, I spent a year at Oxford University in England. Our China study was a collaboration with the University of Oxford and a couple of Chinese academies. So I was there in, in Oxford for a year, and at that time I was already, already getting a lot of pushback. And some of them very mean-spirited, really bad. And so I got into libraries of Oxford and London, and I was asking myself this question. Why all this hostility? Why can't we just do a science and say it like it is? Why do we have to you know, suffer this nonsense? And I, I became, in some ways, the face of that report. That was the most sought after report in history. That's the National Academy of Science report in 1982 on diet, nutrition, cancer. And I, I sort of, in some ways, at least in my community, became the face of that report because I was given testimony before congressional committees. I was on uh, McNeil Lair PBS show. I was featured in People magazine, all this kind of stuff. And <clears throat> what came out of that was some very mean-spirited nonsense. I mean, I was in my own society, I should add this. I wasn't in our professional society. I had just been nominated by the executive council to be president. I told that reversed, that, was, that vote was reversed. Two weeks later, a petition was put to have me thrown out of my society. That was really, and I had to go to Washington to go listen to this nonsense. You know, that kind of stuff started happening. So come 85, 86, <clears throat> I was interested, just from a, you know, set aside this personal side of it, but just to have a look. Why are we so blockheaded about this sort of nonsense? And I, it was fantastic. I wrote a paper for myself quite lengthy of, of what I've learned during the early 1900s and 1800s and all the way back to 1700s. And I was looking for some kind of scientific explanation for this nonsense. And I think I found something. I'm really convinced. 
That was 85, 86. I gave the, the paper on one instance to a, a conference on the history of science in England, but that's in the year 86. I set it aside, never did anything with the rest of the paper. Recently, about two years ago, three years ago, I had it retyped and put it together, and I started looking at this, comparing that history with what we now do. I, I can tell you a lot of the reasons why we now live in a rabbit hole. We took the wrong path, and I can explain it, in my view. I can explain it uh, just by scientific evidence and how people distorted the evidence, how they left stuff out, how they added stuff in. And all of it really had to do with that, in part, not all of it, uh, because there's also this belief system that we humans seem to have that is not, or it is not only appropriate to eat animals, which I have been doing, in fact, it was not only appropriate to eat them, but it was essential to get that good nutrition. False. Flat out false. And so we also do other things. We start eating a lot of processed foods because they make money. Even though the ingredients in processed foods might have come from plants, they don't work that way. Like eating a donut, a vegan donut. That's, that's, that doesn't do much of anything. Still loaded up with fat and sugar and stuff like this. So I don't equate what I'm talking about, incidentally, with either vegan or vegetarian things. I, I honor what they're doing, and they had their own reasons for getting to where they did, and it's nice that we're sort of compatible in, in some, some senses. But I'm talking about the whole food plant-based diet as based on science, strictly on science, not on some ideology, even though I respect you know, those views. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, Right, and I'm quite passionate about this because I work in a government. I wasn't a member of the government, but I was a so-called <laughs> expert on the quality of these committees. And I've seen how it works. I've seen it from the historical perspective. I've seen it from the political perspective of this day. And I can think of nothing, nothing, that is a bigger, in, in a sense, that is so powerful in the information, yet at the same time is so little known by the public. So this conference here, you know, the real truth about health is that obviously what you're doing is really important because it's basically opening up this information, you know, to others. I've been to involved in a number of different these kind of projects and other conferences are now doing this as well. And um, everybody's doing their thing in a sense, a lot of people are. And I there's movement. There's movement. I mean, I, we wrote our book back in 2005, and of course I was getting to be known about this in the 1980s and earlier. And uh, what I didn't intend to be, because that's not where I thought it was going, I was just following the science, that's what I see. And so what we have is, we've got a failed system now. The war on cancer is a failure. Been around for 41 years whatever it is, something like that. It's a total failure. Our whole notion of living on drugs as a means of promoting health, garbage. Now, is there, is some drugs here and there, okay. You know, it's, they're, they're useful for certain things, but not to rely on that as, you know, our future, that's nonsense.